So we have, first of all, Tommy Calvert Jr., who is the co-founder and general manager of KROV Community Radio. And they lined up in alphabetical order. <laughs> Lauren Ferris, who is a member of Gausa, a fantastic photographer, videographer, and a transgender activist who's been in the community for a long time. Um, next to Lauren, in a wonderful bow tie, is Maria Salazar, Chicana, lesbiana, activist, child advocate, family law attorney, and friend to many, many of us. Another who's been in for a long time. And finally, Alicia Torres, an amazing activist who's been working with a group called La Tuya, doing immigrant rights, as well with the Dreamers and the great work being done by undocumented young people um, in San Antonio, but also nationally and international work. And they had an amazing event today as well. Um, so now I would like to ask all of you to just sh share a little bit more about who you are, about um, how, you know, the work that you do in the, in the community, um, from your perspective, because I just gave a little piece. And also, if you could kind of answer the question of why are we here? We're, we're here partially because San Antonio is considering revisions to its non-discrimination ordinance to add in sexual orientation, gender identity, and veteran status. But really, that's just a little, little piece in a very long struggle to protect people from all kinds of discrimination in our community. So we want to talk about the big picture at the same time as we talk about what's happening right now. So share for us. This is 2013, what is the current status of discrimination and human rights in general in San Antonio? Thanks. Good evening everybody. It's great to see a lot of friends here and uh, I want to thank Graciela and Esperanza Cinder and Amanda and all the panelists for joining and all of you for joining. Uh, with us uh, tonight for, I think, a historic conversation for our city and for uh, Texas and for the nation. Um, I am Tommy Calvert, Jr. I am, uh, as said before, the uh, general manager and the janitor at KROP. <laughs> Do it all. And uh, I have a morning show at, at the radio station. We're San Antonio Community Radio uh, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. And I'm very uh, proud that some of you in the audience have been on that show. Uh, where we talk about community issues. That's the that's powerful thing of urban radio is that it is connected to the realities of what people are going through, uh, not just Britney Spears' latest outburst. And so we, we, do, we, we will talk about Amanda Bynes and Britney Spears. That's, that's okay. But we try to be of more substance and of more help to build bridges in our community. And as you can see, I happen to be African American, and so the issue of homophobia within the African American community is a big one. It is one that we that we deal with on a very regular basis uh, on on our show, and uh, we try to we try to build bridges and, and understanding through mass media. Um, we were founded uh, after Clear Channel cut cut off the only urban radio station uh, in San Antonio when the number one urban radio show host. Uh, Tom Joyner said he was going to support the president, Barack Obama, back in the 08 primary. They cut him off the next day, and so, um, yeah, go figure. Um, so we, we formed as a community to say that we need to have a voice, and so our call letters, K-R-O-V, stand for Restore Our Voice. And that voice is not just the voice of the African American community, but it is the voice of the gay community, it's the voice of the Hispanic community, it's the voice of the people um, to be able to have a presence on broadcast uh, FM airwaves. So my, my background is actually in international relations and economics with a specialty in global conflict and negotiation. And uh, part of the reason that I'm here is because I believe that man's greatest challenge on this earth is to be able to live side by side with his fellow man, to be perfectly honest. Here, here. That's that's part of the reason why I did a concentration in global conflict. 
we, you know, whether whether it's the issue, the, the biggest issue that I'm working on right now deals with discrimination is the economic apartheid that is within our governmental entities where the same families keep getting the money in this town and entrepreneurs are left out of the robustness of our uh, municipal and other quasi-governmental entities. That has to change. Yeah. So we've been fighting very hard through a new coalition, the Fair Contracting Coalition, to make that happen. So I'm, I'm going to, you asked a ton of questions, so I'm not going to answer all of those. I'm going to move the mic down uh, just to say that uh, I am uh, I am here as someone who can be a bill bridger to uh, communities that that have natural alliances but are sometimes driven into division by misinformation uh, by what I believe are um, sometimes big business interests that don't want to see the uh, acceptance of rights to gay Americans, transgender Americans, because that acceptance of rights would lead to uh, monetary uh, sacrifices in their mind. And so I hope we get into that a little bit tonight about the hidden agenda of who funds some of the uh, conservative movement and why. So. Yes. Again, my name is Lauren Ferris, and um, <clears throat> for this ordinance and with, with CAUSA, I actually represent Transgender um, Education Network of Texas, and um, I'm also president of the San Antonio Gender Association, which is a local organization that um, serves as a support and advocacy group for the transgender community in San Antonio. Um, last weekend, as, as an advocate, and, and um, I travel around the state sometimes, and last weekend was the um, Texas Transgender Non-Discrimination Summit in Houston, Texas. And we went, and sometimes it's very, it's a very upbeat conference, and a lot of people present, and we learn a lot, but sometimes to hear about what's going on in other places around the state um, is very disconcerting. Because you think that San Antonio is being progressive and that we're moving forward. And I met this woman and we were talking and she said she was from Brownsville. And I said, oh, things in the valley have, have really been difficult. She goes, yes. But you know that, that um, for the city of Brownsville, we are, our city employment is now fully inclusive, including gender identity. And that was, and it, and it took my breath away. And when the city council voted on it, it was unanimous. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, so that's where we are. That was one of your questions. Where are we in San Antonio? We're way behind. Almost 180 yeah. Yeah. municipalities um, <clears throat> nationwide um, include um, sexual orientation and gender identity. 17 states in the District of Columbia, and San Antonio is way behind, lagging behind. Um, as as um, Tommy put it earlier, we're at the back of this train, and, and we really are, and it's time for us to move forward. Um, sexual orientation is currently covered by the city of San Antonio in employment non-discrimination, um, but not gender identity or gender expression. In fact, there's never been a policy or ordinance in the city of San Antonio that covered gender identity, that covered the transgender community. So as far as we are concerned, and, and, and I'll own that, as far as I am concerned, this is a discrimination city. There st are still um, second class citizens um, who've never been recognized as yeah. anything else. Yeah, so that's why I'm here, and I'm going to go ahead and pass the microphone on. But, and we will get more into this, I'm sure, as we move along. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Maria Salazar, and uh, I'm happy to have a full audience here. So uh, my hope for this evening is that we can have a conversation uh, about 
uh, our personal experiences and about what we can do to make our city and our community a better community. Um, some of you know that I came to San Antonio in 1997. I moved here with my compañera of uh, now 18 years. Um, and this is one of the first places that I had visited. In fact, one of the reasons I thought San Antonio was a good city to move to from San Francisco <laughs> was because this city had three things that I needed. One was a decent coffee shop, uh, yeah. which is no longer here. <laughs> uh, the other is that there was an arts community, and, and there, were, there was a thriving arts community. And the third is that there was an activist community uh, that had a vision for uh, uh, progress for a, a progressive vision where everyone is uh, included and so I moved here uh, we moved here because my partner's uh, father had gotten very ill and we moved here to help take care of my fam la familia like, like good Mexican daughters that we are that's what you did you came back home to take care of your family uh, we ended up staying here uh, and uh, I worked for the Esperanza for many years. I consider myself an activist first, an, an activist, an advocate second, and an attorney third. Um, I do work here in San Antonio as a attorney. My area of practice is in family law, and I have found myself practicing child advocacy. I represent children who are in the foster care system, uh, or represent parents who are trying to get their families back together, and I see everything. And when I see everything, we see immigration issues, we see drug substance abuse issues, we see domestic violence issues. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there is discrimination that happens with families uh, because a child may not be expressing themselves the way we've been socially constructed to express ourselves. Um, or because a mother is a lesbian and she's afraid to leave a relationship because she's realized who she is and she's afraid to leave a marriage and afraid to lose her, her children um, and so finds herself in, in a quandary, you know, what, what is a court system going to say if they fight for custody? So I see a lot of issues coming up. Uh, I'll share a personal experience uh, uh, to get about, you know, hoping that we get into dialogue and conversation uh, about some of the confusion and, and uh, misunderstanding that's out there. Uh, I have a sister who's two years younger than, than I am, and we look a lot alike. And when, uh, when I was five, uh, when we were going to school, uh, my mom had these two of these ribbons. And I always found, uh, it always struck me that at such a young age, my mom did two different things with that ribbon. She took the ribbon and she tied little bow ties on my sister, little pigtails, little bow ties. And when she came to dress me to get us ready for kindergarten, she made a bow tie. <laughs> and there's a picture floating around there in the family archives. And, and I think, you know, and I love that bow tie, and I think as, as a parent, my mother was able to nurture who I was and recognize who I was. And I think that's what really this ordinance is all about, is embracing each other and recognizing uh, who we are and that we need to come from empowered places to be the very best that we can. I'll tell you that my work with children is that uh, there's an old beach show, yeah, the people who tell the truth, son los locos y los niños. <laughs> la personas que dicen la verdad son los locos y los niños will tell you the truth um, and, and you know children can look right through you and, and, I, and the way I live my life um, is that this is what I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable in a suit I'm comfortable in, in uh, loafers you know put me high heels and I'm going to trip all over the place <laughs> put me in a dress and I'm going to look like I just came from the crazy house you know because I, I look like I'm not comfortable you might as well put me in um, whereas every, you know, other people have, you know, but I'm a woman and I identify as a lesbian. Um, and the best that I can do is, is to look at my honesty. This is how I dress when I go to court. And this is how we need to be out. Um, I shared earlier with, in a meeting with uh, Shirley Gonzalez that San Antonio has come a long ways. Um, I was licensed to practice law in 2007. When I started practicing law here in Bear County, there's these local rules. And uh, the local rules provide guidance. This is a dress code for attorneys. 
revise that so that it's much more, uh, so that the dress code for attorneys is, you know, just as long as it's respectable and business attire. But if you look to 1990 or 1985, the dress code for women was very gender biased. Women had to wear skirts. So, you know, when you look at that, it's like a lot of progress has been made. And so, I, I, you know, I think I'm able to walk into the courthouse and live my life honestly and challenge those notions of what gender is, what sexual orientation is, and who we are. And I think that's what this ordinance is about, is recognizing that we have different ways of expressing ourselves. We, you know, we, we love our communities, and however that comes out, that's how it comes out. Um, and for some, that's not okay, and we need to have those protections in place. Um, so, yes, we need guidance, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this particular ordinance. Uh, but when I say we need guidance, you know, we need to be very clear and have a dialogue of what, what is, what is, what is, what is, what does it mean to be gender? What does it mean to have sexual orientation? What does it mean to be, uh, how you express yourself uh, in, in, that, in that way? And I'm hoping that we can recognize the cross sections of that uh, in terms of how race plays into that, how class plays into that, uh, how language, how our status, and when I mean status, I mean uh, veteran status or uh, your mental health status just you know it those are all things that cross one another yeah. and uh, we need to be aware of that racism classism racism for sure looks very different you know than, than, than it is to than what it looked like in 1965 what it looks like today and uh, you know I'm looking across the room here and I see a lot of activists here so this got this ordinance it's, it didn't happen overnight. This particular ordinance, people have been working on it for the last two years. The issue of civil rights, the issue of uh, discrimination, people have been struggling uh, and dealing with this for the last decade. San Antonio has great history when it comes to activism and civil rights. Um, the Esperanza is a big part of that history. Um, and, you know, I just want to rec just, you know, I'm look see different faces here, uh, you know, Brad Lewis, Mike Rodriguez, uh, Eduardo Juarez, and, and Gilbert Garcia. You know, just, you know, all of us have a role in this, and uh, the struggle continues, and we need to keep pushing forward. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can have that dialogue and, and, and understand why we need to have this ordinance go through. And, and when we talk about where we are, you know, we have a very, we are in the worst <laughs> district when it comes to law. We have the most conservative laws, we have terrible rulings. Um, and, and when I was in law school, you know, we would hear things like, oh, this case is from Texas, and the entire class would go, oh, it's gonna be bad. But, um, but when I say checkered, it's like, you know, I, I see family law, and uh, what I see is like, you know, we, we need children, we need to be nurturing homes, and if, you know, if the relationship is a same-sex couple, who cares? This is going to be a child that's going to grow up love and embrace yes, and accept it. Um, but that's, you know, but it's not in the legislature. That's coming from, you know, all of us who are social workers or teachers or parents. And so we need to codify this. We need to put this in law that this is what we see. Um, you know, the local rules are changing. Uh, we're talking about a city ordinance, you know. What's the next level? I want to see the commissioning, or, you know, the, the, the county commissioners adopt such a policy. Oh, okay. You know, I want to see family law change so that there's no discrimination based on one's gender identity or sexual orientation. There you go. Uh, we have, this is just a start, you know, when I say checkered, it's like, well, we got some good policies, we got some bad policies. Um, so, but this is, a, this is where we need to focus to make to make a, a very clear message that San Antonio is not a city that's going to discriminate and that we, we are embracing and accepting of you know the rich communities that we have here. Um, my name is Alicia Torres and I am part of uh, La Tuya um, for uh, the Texas Undocumented Youth Alliance. 
the 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 work that um, I do um, definitely is uh, we did start around um, the work that I'm a part of that I do a part of um, started around 2001 with the big push for the Dream Act um, and whatnot. However, we definitely evolved um, since then. And definitely, I am part of um, a group um, on a national level. We belong to the National Immigrant Youth Alliance, and definitely part of a group that wants to expand um, the conversation of past the dreamer, past the perfect. When we think dreamer, we definitely associate with cap and gown, cap and gown from both high school, 4.0 GPA, 4. You know, um, Val Victorian um, out, you know, to. Um, college and whatnot. Uh, we think of it that way because here in Texas, uh, you know, we've had insane tuition for undocumented um, youth since 2001. Um, however, the reality is that um, over 64% of uh, undocumented youth, um, what you know, actually aren't able to go to college. Um, this is across the, the nation. Aren't able to go to college because either they live in a state that doesn't provide the state tuition, or they, you know, even some youth here in Texas, even within state tuition. Um, they're just not able um, to, to go to college because they have to, you know, for help provide for the family in hard economic times and whatnot. Um, so part of my job um, is that it's in one that I'm very proud of and take very seriously is expanding the conversation, expanding the image of a dreamer. You know, we hear that we're all dreamers. Our parents came here and they were, they were are, continue to be, will always be the original dreamers. Um, they, uh, so we definitely, uh, part of uh, the work of La Tuya is expanding um, the conversation and handing over a space in the table for our parents, for domestic workers, for the day laborer, for those um, folks that don't speak English, for those folks that are um, normally spoken for, um, but never asked how they view, how they feel, if they even support any type of legislation that will directly affect them. Um, so that is the work that I do. I like to focus a lot on uh, fighting those, uh, we, I, say, I should say we, we are a, a team, um, on fighting those deportation cases that are not um, cookie cutters, those deportation cases of a youth who might have had, you know, um, an issue with the law because we're not all perfect. Sometimes it's difficult, it's difficult to be undocumented um, in, and why not I, you know, we would like to advocate for the parent who doesn't have, you know, who hasn't been here for 20 years and um, who might not have, uh, might speak English, who's not carrying around the American flag. We believe that everybody deserves um, to be fought for. Um, and, and so we're there for, for that and definitely to, to educate our community um, as far as what their rights are because it's only after you learn that you can fight back that you become empowered. And so we just want to be a tool. We're not. Um, there to tell them, be empowered, you have right. no, Did I turn it off? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hello? Okay. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. so it's really about, uh, about that. We just want to be a tool um, in, a, in acknowledging the privilege that we have in um, that we were brought here as you, that we know English, that we have learned um, the few basic rights that we do have. Um, you know, and basically um, making it right for, for our parents. Um, it might take a long time, but, but we're here to, at least I should speak for myself and for, I know I can speak for, yeah, well, I can't speak for, for them, but um, our group um, is based around that. So definitely um, expanding the, the conversation um, and giving a space on the table for our parents um, and for the rest of the undocumented um, community that does tend to look, um, be looked over and definitely spoken for. Um, now, as far as where we are um, here in, in San Antonio, I think uh, it's very reflective when we have uh, a mayor and a representative that both come from, um, are very proud of, and those that coming from an immigrant um, family, an immigrant community, an undocumented grandmother, but yet here in Texas, here where we currently live, we have the highest number of deportations. Um, you know, we had a representative that took him um, over 10 days to get him to, to sign a letter, a letter of support, um, a letter of support <laughs> for nine undocumented um, youth who have been sitting at Eloy's Detention Center in Arizona. Um, and so it's taken us, um, you know, I think that's very reflective and indicative of where we're at. 
Um, this is someone who in the public eye is, you know, the same day that um, the deadline for the sign-on support letter was going on, he was in Houston um, in a forum for, uh, in support of CIR, but yet he couldn't somehow put a signature or make a call to, to ICE. Um, and so definitely it's not hard and yet the struggle continues. Uh, I mean, it's hard and the struggle does continue and it's been long and, you know, there's always going to be something new. Um, but I definitely think that um, something very important that we mentioned here is um, that we're here and I'm here to today, um, hopefully to um, engage in these conversations and to see um, through this, uh, to learn about these interactions. Um, because something that I come to learn along the way um, is that really we're never going to, we never get anything passed um, until we learn to work together. And the only way that we do that is, is when I make your cause my cause. How does you, how does your cause affect my cause? In the sense of not, uh, not just in the sense of like, I believe that what you're doing is, is right and I want to stand in, um, you know, solidarity. What does solidarity mean? You know, learning to recognize that what's happening to Lauren, you know, that discrimination happens to me too, that it's going to affect me, that if I want a better world for me and for my nieces, nephews, whomever, then I need to make it happen. I need to be an active part of that um, change. The struggles internally begin um, for that struggle. By that I mean, um, we've been doing this for a long time. I've been involved for at least 18 months December 2011 or January 2012, I think, was the first um, CAUSA meeting that I went to. And um, the, the proposal at that time was to um, amend some ordinances. And I'm going to talk about what those are in a moment. But was to amend the ordinances. And then as that group began meeting, um, domestic partner benefits um, were a surprise to the group. but the group agreed that um, the organizations that were represented and brought together there should all support the ordinances and use our effort to support the ordinance, I mean, to, to um, support domestic partner benefits and then use that effort to, to springboard into changing the ordinances and, and that sort of thing. Um, and um, so, so we moved through that we move through conversations of what does fully inclusive mean? What does, what is negotiable and what is not negotiable mean? Um, we, very early on, a group of people met with um, a city official and there was some question about whether or not um, gender identity or expression were negotiable, whether or not those could be taken out. And, and the group worked through that. That's not even a conversation anymore within Gaza, everyone realizes and everyone represents the fact that it's fully inclusive or it's none. And, and every um, and every city council meeting we've had um, with every city council person, one of the questions we, we ask of them is, um, are you supportive of ensuring that there's one vote for sexual orientation and gender identity, not two? And, and we try to extract that commitment from them that those, those two absolutely will not be separated. So before I, I talk about the next steps of, of CAUSA, I'd like to recognize Dee Dee Belmades and Dan Graney. I know they're in the audience somewhere. I don't know where they are, but, but I can't see anyone. But they are, they are the current co-chairs, and they became co-chairs in, um, um, January of 2013, and um, at that time, the the proposal was made that instead of just changing the ordinances, we should have an omnibus type bill. By that I mean, should be a full HRO, full human rights ordinance. It should it should supersede all of the existing ordinances, and um, it should include a human rights commission. It should include a citywide INDA, Employment Non-Discrimination Act, um, as well as all of the other ordinances that, that are currently um, being proposed. And we began to propose that. And then the city, um, the mayor and, and one of the city council people 
or multiple, but but it, but the mayor and others said no. We need to do this as a three-step process. We need to do this as the ordinances. We're going to change the ordinances and we're going to codify them. And there are five ordinances. Somebody's going to have to help me with, as I name these. They are boards and commissions, city contracts, um, city employment is included, housing, public accommodations. Um, and, and I don't know if any of you know, but there is no um, city ordinance in the city of San Antonio that protects you and your employment. If you, if you had an issue with many, many cities, municipalities around the country <coughs> have city ordinances that protect employment. The city of San Antonio does not. So those five ordinances, the current proposal is that, that um, currently city employment is by um, administrative directive from the city manager. The city manager has directed that sexual orientation be a part of the um, um, equal opportunity statement of um, the city employment. That would be put into the co city code as would the other ordinances all put into the city code instead of being individual standalone ordinances. Um, then once those are passed then we would move into getting a a human rights commission and eventually a citywide INDA, an employment non-discrimination, <clears throat> which, if you don't know, um, is one of the um, um, biggest, if not the biggest, issue for the trans community. Um, very typically, and, and things are getting better, but better doesn't mean they're anywhere near good. Um, in the trans community, um, as people come out in their 20s or 30s, um, generally they're, they're married men or women who are intending to transition into a target gender other than their birth gender. And part of that sequence often is they lose their spouse, their family, their job, not necessarily in that order, their housing, um, and so on. We have um, we have trans people in this community in San Antonio who, when they came out, lost their job and may very soon be homeless here in the city of San Antonio. It happens every day. Um, and, and the only place in the city that openly accepts transgender people who, where they can live as who they are, and again, some things are getting a little better, but the only place that currently accepts them openly is the Carson House. Carson House is, is intermediate housing run by the San Antonio AIDS Foundation. Oh, and did I mention there's a little catch to get in there? You have to be HIV positive. Um, and, and there are, I have had, um, I had a trans woman tell me about, oh, nine, ten months ago that for her it was really easy um, to, to get in there because that is a really good place to live. All she had to do was quit using condoms for a short time. Um, so so those, are, those are the kind of things that happen in the trans community in San Antonio and that's why. Do changing these ordinances make it better? Absolutely. Because many, many places in this city that provide shelters, etc. receive city money. And because city contracts is in there, um, some of that begins to get fixed and, and gives us leverage to move at least a little bit forward with beginning to get it, for it to get fixed. Would I rather have an HRO right now, right away? Absolutely. Um, I, as, so my partner of 31 years is here tonight along with my 26-year-old son, who has sp spoken before city council, and I'm sure they would love for me to quit spending so much time in advocacy. Um, I know my son um, travels with me often to, to speak and is often moved, but I'm sure 
they too will be glad when mom can be home again. Um, it, it's, it's been a long road. We've never been recognized, never been recognized in this city. And, and it's long, long, long overdue. Um, that's a very brief um, overview of, of CAUSA. Um, I may have missed some important points here and there, but, but I think for the most part, what's to be voted on in August is rolling the, the five ordinances into the city code, updating them to include sexual orientation, gender identity, veteran status, changing handicap to disabled, um, and some other wording and changes. And we've, we've recently learned that boards and commissions, which is one of the ordinances to be changed, there are some wording in there that we have basically always supported being changed or removed and that is that no past spoken or, or deed um, of discrimination, if, if that occurred, then, then basically you couldn't hold a board of commission. I mean, I believe that is going to be removed. <clears throat> um, so I, I'm sure there will be further questions that I can answer, but I think that gives us um, at least a brief overview. Uh, before the meeting, we were a little early, and I don't know if she saw the flyer sent in the mail that I was on the panel or if she Googled uh, something. Uh, but uh, this council person asked me, uh, so what do you think of the non-discrimination ordinance? And uh, so we, we had a conversation in support, of course, uh, of the changes that you're working toward. And I want to give you some insight into what uh, their thought process is, because some of the arguments I hadn't seen in some of my research prior to coming here that, that you all are addressing uh, to the council. So, so the main crux of this council person's concern was about business. Th this, this council person said, um, well, if a business owner has a personal belief that they don't believe in serving, let's say they're a flower shop, and uh, there's a transgender couple that's having a wedding and they don't want to serve that couple, and they have business at the city, and it's out there that it's, you know, that this is a company that doesn't do that, then these businesses are worried about the stigma and the loss of money and all, all of the fallout that might come. And that, that was kind of the central argument in terms of uh, that council person's concern. It wasn't so much on the, 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 the morality issues that you hear sometimes and all those other kinds of religious right uh, arguments. It was on money and the ability for businesses to continue to m make money off of the city while still being able to discriminate against people that they didn't like. So this community has to do its part uh, to educate and raise the, the understanding, to raise uh, uh, those issues, um, and make sure that uh, council people, and I don't know if you'll be able to persuade the, you know, some council people, some, some folks you just can't win over, but as long as you get your six votes, you got your ordinance. And that's what's important to remember. Um, but I think that the most important thing are conversations like this. This, this past week, I, I called the uh, general manager of PBS, uh, the new general manager, because this town, this, and sometimes it is like Little Cthulhu around here, but, but this city, this city really lacks a strong, robust, urban issue dialogue in TV, on radio, in our mass media. When I live, I lived in Boston for seven years. I've lived in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. And there are, it just is very surprising to me that our television stations, our broadcast entities don't have a more robust conversation, other than mine, other than KRV, right? I'm not included, right? but it, a, a, absolutely, yes, yes. So, so I, I was approaching uh, PBS about putting together on TV, and it partly was 
driven by the Trayvon Martin conversation because of the image that black youth had in the minds of George Zimmerman, it got me thinking, we need to have more people who are the community in our broadcasts and our mass media represented showing positive images. And that too is also a challenge uh, in this uh, debate for the LGBT community to get involved in the media, to show yourselves there, to have a regular conversation, not just when we have a rally, not just when, when there is a um, uh, something to, to, to cry out about, but a continued presence so that, in essence, the broad community uh, that has been so discriminatory understands we're all people, and that's the bottom line. Yes. And we want to be just treated like everybody else, right? So, so, so I, I think that um, where San Antonio is in terms of um, issues of discrimination, I, you know, I really feel we're 30, 40 years behind, whether, yeah. it's, whether it's the issue yeah. of uh, the, the fact that, uh, as I said earlier, the same families keep getting the money or we just keep finding ourselves. I actually think, yes, San Antonio is diverse, but I think there is a veneer of diversity, a veneer of diversity that is almost, I guess you call it a chamber of commerce veneer. That everybody's happy and everything is okay, and it's not. It's not. We, we have a lot of economic disparities. We have social disparities that, um, that this city um, tries to whitewash and forget about. And, and, and that's why these conversations are so important. And so um, just in terms of encouraging uh, this ongoing dialogue, it's important to do what you've done, which is show up. So give yourselves a big round of applause for being a part of the change, because you being here is a big difference. And I forgot your other question. Can I pass the mic? Was there another question? Okay. All right. Let me pass the mic. Okay. I think uh, I, one of the comments I wanted to, that I had was uh, <coughs> as we have this conversation, I, I really want to talk about visibility. You know, I live on the south side of the District 5. Um, and, and there isn't a day that doesn't go by, it, 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 especially in the last couple of years, where you know where I see such a, a variety of, of, of families. And you know, the other night I was driving home from HEB on military, and I was on probat, and I saw this uh, young, these two young women, they're about 17, holding hands. And uh, a couple nights later, I met military, and I saw. I was watching these two young boys, they're about 15, and there's something a little bit different about them. I'm waiting, my partner and I were waiting for our, the light to turn, and they turned around and they kissed each other. And I had the same thought uh, in both those instances when I saw these two young couples. My thought was, I hope they don't get the crap beat out of them. They, I mean, and, that, and, and I hope they grow up, you know, to pursue whatever it is they want to do. I was happy. First of all, half is like, oh my God, you know, these guys are so brave, um, and, and and they were out, and they were, you know, Chicanos, Chicanos, you know, they're on the south side, they're working class, um, and, and and you know, they're in they're in the neighborhood that I know that has, uh, you know, we have longtime city workers there, we have working class individuals, we have, you know, uh, you know, from from the work that I do and. and the neighbors that I talk to, you know, um, undocumented, and, and, and everyone gets along. But I, I just, you know, I had this fear, it's like, you know, I hope they're okay, and, and I want them to be, you know, get the education they want. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm here, is, that, is, to, is to give them hope and, 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 and recognize them that they can, be, you know, be, be proud of their background. So. Um, so I think what you you were talking about is like, you know, if we're here, we also you know need to be part of the, the Dream Act. You know, this is this is a, a a movement, not just about civil rights, but it's about social cultural rights. You know, it's, it's being able to speak the language that we're you know comfortable in, um, and it, it, it's about uh, being able to. Uh, listen to the music we want without any 
you know, <laughs> repercussions from your cranky old neighbor down the street who doesn't like the way the neighborhood has changed. Because um, I because I see that. Um, so so that's where I think we we you know we need to keep that in mind when I think about those two young. They're they're working at the uh, manufacturing, you know, Miller Curtain or you know just you know down on Nogalitos and and you know that's why. Uh, we need to be here and, and advocate because uh, because they're visible and, 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 and it's about community and, and, and being good to one another and honoring one another. Um, so um, I'll, I'll just close it at that. I, I just want—I forgot to add one one important point. I, you know, I talked a bit about the need to address whatever those business policy issues are. The council person was concerned about the details of who would be documenting the discrimination, all kinds of questions that this council person had about how the, the, the uh, as they put it, the devil of the details. But I don't think that, I don't think that, and I know you, you this, this community won't, that we can see the moral high ground on this communication debate either. I, I, um, I was at uh, a Place for Life church uh, on Sunday talking about the Trayvon Martin issue, and I told the congregation there that uh, when I was the head of the American Anti-Slavery Group in Boston, working to create awareness about the genocide in Sudan, I had a great left-right coalition. I had uh, Pat Robertson and Al Sharpton that I worked with. I didn't put them in the same room together, <laughs> but I learned from both of them. And what I learned is that we liberals and progressives, we tend to be very policy-oriented, very uh, uh, policy heavy and conservatives tend to look at a culture and they tend to look at um, that the, the, the framing of that culture and I think the answer of moving a policy and moving a, a, a things forward is a synthesis of both I think you need both and um, a couple of years ago we brought uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Eric Dyson to Martin Luther King Academy and I'll never forget that there at MLK Academy, Dr. Dyson, who we all see on TV um, uh, commentating on different issues of our day, he, as a minister, said that we have to be accepting uh, of our gay brothers and sisters from a theological perspective, because who are we as human beings to put a limit on God's love? We as human beings cannot uh, dictate to God that he loves one over the other. That God loves us all. Um, and God, we are all created in God's image. And so I think that that moral speaking is important as you go forward to uh, persuade minds, persuade legislators, change hearts, keeping the conversation going, and that you can even meet people where they are in their faith perspective, or what they, they think is their faith perspective. Yeah. Um. So I know we want to get to, to questions really quickly, but I have to make a comment. Since you brought him up, I wouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> Pat Robertson. Uh, this, this week, Pat Robertson made a comment about trans people that um, he was asked the question about um, should, should a minister um, discriminate, basically, against a transgender person in their congregation and he said no he said no you should accept them as who they are and 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 love them for the the man or woman that they're becoming and that they have become and but not so fast because because coming from Pat Robertson you have to really understand that what he's doing is supporting the gender binary he, the only reason that he would say that's okay is because it supports his vision of the world and his vision of binary. Men are men and women are women and if they look like they're supposed to look, then it's okay. And, and it's not really okay. And, and I think we have to get below that veneer and, and see what, even when people say something that sounds like they support us, they don't necessarily. Alicia, would you like to say a few more words before we open it up? Um, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Just very, very fast, because I definitely think this is a space, you know, to learn how we can move um, forward. And all of us support um, 
God said, you know, in, in the separate them definitely be be led by by them. Um, but um, something um, I don't even know where I had to put it. But you know, something that the one of the reasons why I I decided to okay yes I'll uh, I'll join um, you know I'll come and, and I'll speak because I really don't like public speaking um, is the fact that um, within and bringing it back to the immigration um, you know discussion um, just a little bit is the fact that a lot of um, um, a lot of the, the people that have been at the forefront uh, I dare say the people that actually started the conversation and continue to move the conversation forward and push envelopes within the, the immigrant um, you know movement aren't like the cookie cut politicians aren't the cookie cut dreamers they have been all all of them have been members of the LGBTQ community they're not given um, the and they're not looking after you know they don't care about being in the media and whatnot but something that does bother me a lot is the fact that they are not given um, the respect in the sense that whenever something is brought up in legislation, and it, it came to mind when you mentioned legislation, is they, um, uh, you know, that's always the, the community that seems to be um, considered the, oh, let's, they're going to bring us down. Like, they, we have to get rid of them, you know, like they were only good enough to get us to this point, and why not? You know, and, and it happens in, a, in not just immigration conversation, it happens in a lot of, um, you know, we'll call them social <laughs> issues that we're, that we're trying to move forward. Um, and uh, it's not surprise. It's not surprising to me. And also the thing is um, that I always that I've learned, you know, from uh, from my friends um, that are part of the Turkish community and, and, and uh, family members is the fact that um, the, that oppression has been there for so long that they become so resilient. And I can only, you know, I admire um, them um, so so much. And um, going back to you know the legislation is um, something that we've learned along the ways. Also is that before we even talk legislation, you know, um, before we even consider putting anything in paper, we have to be able to have the conversation and say, you know, a lot of people say, well, you want it all or nothing and you can have it. No, I can have whatever I want when we have the conversations and I know that you're not going to sell me out and I'm not going to sell you out and that only happens uh, when we're able to sit down and go over, hatch out our differences and, and you know, and a lot of those uh, conversations are really hard to have because they go into like, you know, um, the whole moral issue and how do I really feel about it? And it's always important to challenge ourselves, to be able to make, to be okay with making somebody feel uncomfortable, but we have to address them and we need to know where we stand, um, you know? And so um, it's with any legislation, it's, it's always like that and it's always going to fail if you're not, we're not going to be able to 100% stand behind it. And so I, that's something that I really li liked, you know, the, um, about um, this ordinance that it, it was, there's no space for compromise. Compromise is good, but it only it takes you so much or so far, and it limits you a lot. And so um, I really, really like and, and respect that. I just wanted to say that real quick. We, um, we are going to go ahead and uh, start accepting people to come up to the mic. Melissa, if you could put the house lights on, it would be nice. Yes, great. Um, I do want to offer up a few house rules, which include um, that we want to ask that nobody use any type of hate speech. This is uh, an event where we want, we want the questions to be asked, the hard questions to be asked, the embarrassing questions to be asked. We want um, people to express disagreement if they have disagreement, but we won't tolerate any, um, anybody coming out to um, speak hate against any community. Um, and we also, that's, that's something that I'm saying because there have been a lot of people coming out to city council and saying incredibly awful things um, and this is, Esperanza is not a space where we are going to subject anybody to that violence. Yeah. 
Also, though, I just want to say that it's great. We have lots and lots of people in this room for a Wednesday afternoon. It also means that we ask you to kind of keep your comments as concise as possible. And also, if you come up to speak once and then you get kind of that um, feeling like you really have to speak again, um, if you could just wait until all of the people who are waiting to speak have spoken and then when it kind of gets that quiet feeling like there's nobody willing to jump up that's your turn to go again um please graciela is going to help out with the mic so you know if you get over the three minute mark you're going to hear it <laughs> five minutes not city council great Hi, uh, I'm Luis Cifuentes. I am a teacher at MLK Academy uh, on the south side. I have a question regarding the votes and the council. You said it takes six votes. Where do we stand? Who do we have to talk to? Who do we, whose door do we have to knock on to make sure that this legislation does pass? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, so I hope tonight you have the information so you can do it. I hope everyone in this room, when you go home, you will send um, an email or, or call, call would be even better, the mayor and everyone else on that list, all 10 of them. However, um, there, are, there, are, there are currently, well, there, there are a lot of questions. Obviously, Diego Bernal in District 1 is sponsoring it. Um, Ivy Taylor is on the fence, so please call her in District 2, and and really, um, if, especially if you're in this room and you're African American, then you should be calling Ivy Taylor every day um, if, if you support this ordinance, sending her emails um, verbally. Now, this doesn't mean don't call. You should still be calling them, but Ray has, has, has said that he supports us. District 5, surely... Gonzalez today um, said that, I mean, not officially, but, but um, she's still doing her research, but that she believes in equality for everyone. Um, six, who is six? Help me out. Um, Ray Lopez has, has basically said that, that um, of course, they're all still doing their research, but, but he is likely to, to support us. Seven. Um, Chris Medina, we, we met with him today. He was very adamant about the fact that he still has groups to meet with and he's still thinking and he's still doing research. Lobbing lots of calls, lots of emails. Um, District 8, Ron Nirenberg. Ron Nirenberg is still doing a lot of research. He's still um, one of the people that met with him today um, and I wasn't at that meeting, said to me that they feel like he's on the fence. Um, so, Log in the calls, do the emails, make sure. District 9, um, um, my, my former councilwoman, um, Elisa Chan, has already said that she will not vote for it, as has Carlton Souls. Yeah. And, and what we've heard late, re very, very recently is that Carlton Souls has moved even a little further away. Um, um, he, was, he was at a point of of, I don't know how to describe it, just not saying anything but voting against it and just not meeting with us to perhaps opposing it. So that's, and that's pure scuttlebutt. But, um, and the mayor of course supports it. Um, no one in the city, as he has said, is a second class citizen to him. And, and um, so there's, there's the votes. Is that six votes? Maybe, maybe. Um, but, but maybe not as well. And I'm sure there are people in this audience who can do a better job than, than I just did, but, but that's, that's a rough idea of, of where it stands. I, I just want to make, so as, a, as someone who uh, helps whip votes from time to time, I'll just say that uh, on the other side of the aisle, they are mobilizing in, their, in the churches against this ordinance. They've asked my father, of course he said no, to join with them. and so. You've got to understand that uh, what Lauren just said is a rallying cry. You are the troops that need to go forward, and uh, you're a great, uh, you're a great group of troops. There's a lot of great people in this audience, and it's time to do the phone banking. It's time to uh, wake people up. It's time to hit the strip and let folks know. It's time to stop uh, just singing and dancing and shaking your rear. It's time to get to work. There's something. 
there's something at stake here. So, uh, okay, there's going to be a specific charge with dates on the end. So the point I'm trying to make is these folks in the city council positions often are counting the, the folks that are calling and mailing and emailing. So if you don't feel comfortable talking through it, you can't email through it, you can't write through it, but they are taking a whip count. I think most of them are supportive in their hearts, but you've got to give them the political cover to do the right thing and to know that there is a constituency, a very big constituency here in this city because the church, the church coalitions, which they tend to go to at election time, are more organized seemingly uh, than uh, this community. So this, the, the community of caring that wants to, and it's a coalition, the coalition has to begin to show its uh, political power and use all of the things that can transform. You've got to do education like you're doing today. You've got to do political coalition building. You've got to do uh, some direct social action. You've got to employ all of the tools to make sure that the city council people know where you stand, where this community stands. And we're going to be a progressive community that moves forward and isn't held behind uh, by the old uh, things that have divided us. Lauren, uh, you made reference to that uh, part of the ordinance that has to do with the appointment of officials and members of boards of commissions. And uh, for me, that was the one sticking point that needed to be taken out of the, uh, of the ordinance. So are you fairly certain that when the final draft goes before the city council that that's gonna be taken out? Um, there are probably a couple of people in the room who can speak to that better than me, but yes. Yes, I am. Um, and, you know, I just went through all, all 10 districts, and I would have gotten Ray Lopez in a second. Randy Bear, I didn't even know there were 10 districts in the city till I met you. So thanks for teaching me to be able to do this. Um, Maria, did you have a comment to make before the last question? No, well, just to stress that it really is important to call your city council members, especially if you live in those districts where, uh, uh, you know, we're not getting a whole lot of support, okay? Uh, they really do, you know, meet with them locally, leave messages at the local satellite offices, call the city hall offices. Uh, when we met with uh, Councilman Gonzalez uh, this, this morning, uh, it was a very good conversation. Uh, and, and, and I think that contact really makes a difference. You know, District 5 change. We went from having a city council that, uh, a city council representative who, you know, said no lesbian and gay people lived in his district. Okay, <laughs> to someone who made time to meet with a group of folks in support of this ordinance. So it makes a difference. Um, so if you live in District 4, if you live in District 2, if you do business in those areas, you know, call them and let them know that you want them to support this ordinance. Do, um, does anyone that, that has a copy of the ordinance TV, whoever, can somebody read that? It's only a sentence or two. Can you read it? So everyone knows what we're talking about? Yeah, this is under appointment, uh, appointed official boards and commissions, and it's paragraph B, and it says priority discriminatory acts. No person shall be appointed to a position of the city uh, if the city council find that such a person has prior to such proposed appointment engaged in discrimination or demonstrated a bias by word or deed against any person, group, or organization on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, general identity, uh, gener gender identity, veterans uh, status, age, or a lot of disability. And I have a personal interest in that because I'd be disqualified for all the stuff that I've been saying about the religious right for the last few months. Right, and that's, the intent is that that, would, that, that portion of the statement would be re removed, but the boards and commission wouldn't be removed, just a portion of that to reword it because um, you know you can't. It's a First Amendment thing, and and it would bar a lot of us. Lauren, I have a copy of the latest draft, and it has been stricken. Good. Uh, um, Gilbert has a copy of the latest draft on his phone, and it has been stricken. So, so the answer is absolutely yes. Um, hi, my name is Kyle Leo. I'm just new to San Antonio. I'm from uh, Southern California, and I. Um, 
Uh, Tommy, you talked about where you are all people, more you said something about, you said talked about recognition, Maria. Talked about visibility and honoring. And Alicia you talked about respect. Um, in the area I live in, um, I guess I guess the first question I should want to say is why why is the recognition so important? And why is recognition so important? And I know probably here a lot of people support the issues that you're talking about and discussing. Um, I guess in the back of my head, I'm thinking about some people in my family and people that I live with wouldn't be so supportive. And I guess if they were here right now, um, what would you say, what, what would you tell them about why is recognition so important? And I, and I bring this up um, in conflict resolution, it, the iceberg. Sometimes people see the tip of it and at the bottom, they're connected when it comes to respect, honoring, recognition. So if you could maybe like, what would you say? Why is that so important? If you are not recognized, you can't fulfill your purpose. And if we have an America, if we have a world where people are unable to fulfill their purpose, we have uh, a, a less perfect union. We have a, a, a world that's hampered and diminished and not as great as it can be. And so for me, when you ask that question, the recognition is really critical to providing a foundation upon which people can achieve their dreams and not be blocked by their government in doing that. And, and from a, um, well, I want to answer that two ways. First, statistically, um, municipalities where, where it's been biased, businesses actually grow. That's why 85% are of the Fortune 500 are inclusive and have these policies because you create an environment where people know they can live and prosper. And when people know they can live and, and prosper in an environment, they do much better. Um, and and the, the second thing I wanted to say about that is um, I can give you some very specific um, examples of, of blatant discrimination and there's nowhere for us to go. There's nowhere to complain. There's, there's, there's just nowhere to go. I mean, um, um, uh, my partner and I had wanted to open a business, and, and we were told point blank after you know a week or so of excuses. Well, we don't want that kind of business. Well, okay. Well, I didn't mean that kind of business, but you know you can't do this and you can't. Well, finally, he just said outright to us, "I don't rent to people like you." And, you know, I'm used to white privilege and white male privilege for a lot of my life. And, and I really recognize that. And, and you really have to understand that, that, I, that I'm, I'm in a place where, where I can no longer live and prosper. I'm in a place where I can no longer move forward. I'm in a place where I'm in a, dis and, and as I told Chris Medina today, I'm in a discrimination city because that's really what this is. Mm -hmm. I would just add that you know recognition and visibility is is important because it's the truth. And if we don't recognize and have that visibility, then we don't see the injustice that's happening. If we don't tell each other our stories, then we don't see how we're saying to those folks is that we have to be visible and we have to share our stories so we understand each other's humanity and we understand our connection to one another. You're right, it's the tip of the iceberg. When you, you, uh, uh, one of our best friends is, is a, you know, is a cornerstone, uh, attends cornerstone, and I don't know how we get along, <laughs> but we do, you know. Um, uh, I know, I'm trying to look at my friend over there. <laughs> uh, but because we, we recognize each other, you know, we recognize our families, that we have the same struggles, you know, we're, we're trying to pay for bills, we're trying to take care of our parents. We're worried about, you know, our neighbor next door. Uh, you know, we have to talk to one another. I'm looking at a friend of mine over there who told me about, you know, a woman being threatened with deportation because she was involved in this, you know, school activity. And, you know, if I don't know that's going on, then, you know, how can we work to strive to be, you know, a better community? So visibility is important, recognition is important, because if you don't see me, if I don't see you, then we erase one another, and we can't erase one another. Um, I guess just to put it real quick, uh, you know, you said how do you, specifically for your family, you know, how do you communicate that? 
and um, the easiest way that I can um, that I can put it is um, is that you know if you by approaching them you know um, the, it's just saying if I can't fully love myself how can I give the best of myself and that holds very true you know you all if, if you can't just fully accept everything that you are and love everything that you are if you're gonna restrict yourself in front of your family your friends or whatever you're never going to give the best of yourself and that you're never going to be happy and that's why it's important to accept yourself and to be visible so that other people can respect you and can know everything that you are and appreciate everything that you are. Yeah. You know, it, it sounds very yeah. cliche, but it's the hardest thing that I found um, that I hear and I found, you know, to, to do. Um, but I kind of, you know, <laughs> going in all the different directions right now. My head is, but um, but that's why why it's important. It's it's a uh, recognition and, and respect is. Um, I want to give you the best of me, um, but if you want that, then you need to learn to love me and respect for everything, um, everything that I am, so that you can, I can give you that, that back, you yeah. know. And that's the only way that we, that we were able to move forward um, in, in the right direction, you know. And, and we're able to have um, a created atmosphere, space when we can grow and our kids can grow um, happy and healthy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I spent my whole life thinking I was a feminist, um, and then I then I transitioned, and I realized that I wasn't able to really grasp the white male privilege I had unspokenly for so long. And I and I think we have to exactly like you said, from both sides. And I'm sorry, <laughs> from both sides we have to be able to release the privilege that we have and love and respect each other just for who we are without privilege. And, and it's a struggle, but I think we really have to do that.